in the past decade, there has been a complete revolution in optics. Optics today looks completely different than it used to be 15 years ago. And it's basically the same revolution that microelectronics went through. So today, you can define lithographically hundreds of thousands of optical elements. So these include lenses, miniaturized fibers, waveguides, splitters, all the components that we usually use in a microscope, for example, we can print lithographically using microelectronic techniques. And now there are many, many foundries that would do that for you. So this field is very young. It started about 15 years ago. The idea is that you could actually make optics using silicon. Silicon, up to 15 years ago, was only a microelectronic material. No one ever did anything with light using silicon. And now, this field, the silicon photonics, is everywhere. All major companies doing anything with microelectronics are also doing silicon photonics. So the reason why this field evolved so quickly is because of the demand. There was an enormous demand at the time from all kinds of different industries for this massive integration of optics. One of the biggest rally behind us that actually pushed this field forward was the microelectronic and the computing industry. So microelectronic computing industry, they had an awful, uh, terrible problem uh, 15 uh, years ago, and it's still a problem that uh, is still there, which is power dissipation. So in computing, there is an enormous uh, 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 problem with power dissipation, and, and just heating those data centers, for example, is, uh, is an enormous challenge. Think about it. Where are all the data centers that you know? located, say data center from Amazon, from Microsoft, from, from Google, they are all in Alaska, in Ireland, very cold places next to rivers. Now, where does this heat dissipation come from, this power dissipation come from? It's not computing. It's only data transmitting. That's what consumes all the power, transmitting data from, say, your processor to your memory, or from processor to processor. That's what consumes all the power. But optics, or silicon photonics, can alleviate that. We can actually link microelectronic components to processors, processor to memory, using light, and that doesn't burn any power. Have you ever touched a fiber? It's always cold. Have you ever touched a cable? It's always hot. It's fundamental. It has to do with the frequency of light versus the frequency of RF or, or, or uh, uh, microwave frequency, right? The, the gigahertz that you're trying to, tra to transmit your data. So 15 years ago, the microelectronic industry say, hey, said, hey, we need optics on a chip scale, and we need it to be on silicon. That was a, 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 a huge effort. Uh, uh, my group was lucky to, to start this uh, endeavor. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you what are the, the challenges. So this is a picture for you to remember what, what's the motivation. This is an image of Microsoft taking one of their computing racks and dropping it into the ocean. This is just for you to remember what's the demand, how desperate uh, the, uh, the computing industry is for a solution. And by far, all of this power dissipation comes from transmitting data and not from computing. Okay, so to get actual optics on a chip, we had to address several of the problems. So one of the problems 
is how to actually put waveguides one next to another. And I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about that. Or how to even get light into those waveguides. These waveguides, when I say waveguide, I mean kind of miniaturized fiber that are lithographically defined on silicon. These waveguides are 100 nanometers, 200 nanometers in cross section. I need to get light into them and out of, out of them form a fiber. The fiber is at least 10 microns, 10 to 100 microns. We're talking about completely different orders of magnitude. And light actually needs to propagate in and out. OK, so, the, uh, so let me get into, into the details. OK, so this is a tiny little waveguide. And you can see light on uh, propagating inside. And now we have a huge fiber. Now, light in principle has to go in and has to go out. And here I didn't even plot it to scale. So that was, this is an example of what we had to struggle with. These were some of the issues we had to struggle, like this one, were almost fundamental. We have a fundamental discrepancy in, 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 uh, uh, in size. So often I give my students this problem and I say, OK, you have a, a fiber and you have a tiny little waveguide. And the waveguide has to be small in order to massively, uh, to be lithographically defined. And also just because of the high index of refraction of silicon, that is the size that light propagates best. If you actually make it larger, you will end up with what we called multi-modes, meaning the, the actual propagation of light will not be optimum. So the actual natural size for light to be totally confined is this size. So I tell the students, OK, calculate how much light would actually go through if you put a fiber into it. And you can calculate from first principles. And it's about 3%. So that's actually how we all worked. 20 years ago when I was doing uh, uh, my uh, PhD, that's what we did. We kind of aligned very carefully the fiber onto the waveguide, did a little bit of prayers, and sent it in. But before, but when we actually t took this seriously and said, OK, sil silicon photonics, if we want it to become a reality, we actually have to solve this problem. So uh, this was a. Uh, a uh, task that we tackled uh, just when I started uh, my career at um, Cornell University at the time. The solution was to put a little tip at the end of the waveguide. So what am I saying? Say you have your huge fiber, and I'm telling you that, and I have my little waveguide here, I can get all the light sucked beautifully inside this tiny little waveguide if I make my waveguide smaller. Meaning, if I take my waveguide and, and actually taper it down the end, like a pencil. And that is actually how all silicon photonics today are uh, used. At the end, at the edges of every chip where you actually put your fiber, this is how they do. They use what we called inverse taper. So I remember when the student came and, uh, and said, you know, this might be a solution. We, we kind of try to understand exactly what is happening. And what's happening is that when you actually taper it down to a little uh, needle, you are delocalizing light. Basically, light before was all nicely inside the wave, but when you make it very, very small, everywhere. So it looks like that. It starts in the wave and all gets delocalized. And you can actually engineer it that it will be the size of the fiber. So today we can have light in and out of these chips seamlessly. And I can show you a movie now uh, where Light is going to come from the left, from the fiber, and 
this actual simulation, actual physics simulation that shows exactly what's happening and it's all seamlessly, you see there is no reflection, no scattering, light is going uh, through. So we overcame uh, several of these challenges. I gave you w one example. The field started around 2003, uh, uh, 2001, and it completely exploded. This is the field in physics that evolved the fastest. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, except giant magnetoresistance that uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2007. Besides that, this is the fastest growing field. And it's now being used everywhere. It's definitely not just data center anymore. It was such a success. Today, the optical elements that we can make on silicon and the level of integration is so high that the applications are everywhere. So the applications are in medical uh, uh, devices, in uh, uh, sensing, in remote sensing, uh, definitely in, in uh, uh, integration with fluidics. One example of this application is LiDAR for self-driving cars. So today, LiDAR, uh, uh, doing LiDAR with light as opposed to with radio is, uh, uh, is an extremely important goal. And the idea is that you would actually uh, have, and Google is already doing that, have a, 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 a beam on top of the car that would sweep light everywhere. And based on the reflection, I would know where I'm standing. Light has intrinsically much higher resolution than uh, radar, so uh, than RF. Uh, so doing self-driving cars with light is a holy grail. But to actually move a beam mechanically is an enormous, while the car is moving, is an enormous engineering feat. There are elements like that, people sell those, and they cost as much as the car. But silicon photonics can solve it. So silicon photonics, what you could do is emit light through the chip. Okay, so here I'm giving you examples of the LiDAR. And let's say I have, I have my little chip, and that's my little waveguide, and I'm sending light through the waveguide. Just because the size of the waveguide is so much smaller than the wavelength, because the size of the, the size of the waveguide is half the wavelength in the material, but in the material the index is so strong that uh, it ends up being very, very, very small, much smaller than the wavelength in air. It really behaves like a dipole. It emits everywhere. That's not exactly what you want in terms of beam, beaming light. You don't want diffraction. So just one waveguide will work, but massive amount of waveguides where they all work together like this. You send light here, and they all interfere and form a beam. So what I'm saying, you define lithographically many, many waveguides. I'm talking about thousands, hundreds of waveguides. Sending light coming with a fiber and if the spacing is right and everything is right, they will actually form a beam. Now, if you delay one uh, uh, light coming from one wave that relative to another, we know how to do it. The whole beam moves. Okay, so basically just by delaying one beam relative to another, tuning the index of refraction, which we know how to do it very well massively on a chip, the beam is steered. This is basically one of the hardest topics in, uh, uh, in application of silicon photonics. One of the things we, need, we needed to do is make those waveguides very, very low loss because they need to be very, very long. There needs to be massive amount of them. We now can pack meters of waveguides on a chip and we have to do a lot of material science to actually make those surfaces perfect because that's what really contributes to to losses. When you send light inside the waveguide, the material is transparent, it's beautiful. But 
every little one atom, every little fluctuation scatters light. And that's because of what we call the Rayleigh scattering. The scattering is proportional to the index contrast, silicon and air or silicon and oxide, to, to the six. So it's very, very, it's, it's a very strong scattering. So even a single atom makes a difference. And we just recently, this recent paper last year, we were able to demonstrate that this problem is basically solved uh, uh, for these types of waveguides. Perhaps the last thing I want to uh, tell you is new work that we are doing on how to actually delay light on a chip, right? So I, I gave you one example of application where this is very important, sending beaming light. In order to beam light, I need to actually change on, on the spot the index of refraction. This is very hard to do in silicon. We can do it, but it's very hard. Hard meaning a lot of power dissipation, uh, relatively slow, it's, it's, a, it's an issue. And if you are successful, you are changing, just so that you get an order of magnitude, you change your index of refraction by 0.1%. That's amazing if you can do that. So changing uh, index is very hard, slowing down light. We just started working with a new type of, of material. These are two, this is one atom thick materials. Uh, these are monolayers that are semiconductor monolayers. That's called TMD. Uh, uh, these are uh, semiconductor 2D material that they actually, when you actually apply voltage to them, the index of refraction of these materials changes by a lot, by 200%. So we just put it on top of the waveguide. And small change of them changes the whole uh, way that light propagates. Even though the actual waveguide stays the same, but the top of the waveguide is a little disturbed. Okay, so we, we are using now new materials with silicon photonics to make these even more, even stronger uh, in terms of uh, uh, capabilities and, and applications. So I'm going to uh, stop here. Silicon photonics in, is a, an extremely exciting time to, uh, to be working in this area. It's now enabling all different types of research. Uh, we are actually using this in probes uh, f to stimulate uh, uh, optogenetic, uh, uh, tiny little optical probes. Uh, uh, and, it, and it basically ranges, applications range from all kinds of different uh, disciplines. Thank you.